Hebrews 5. I'll read to verse 10, and we'll get into our study tonight as we continue our verse-by-verse study here in the book of Hebrews. Um, The writer writes, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also beset by weakness. Because of this, he is required, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, But it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And as he has also said in another place, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, we're going to be looking at Jesus Christ as he's presented to us as our high priest. As I've mentioned to you before, in the Old Testament, the priests were like bridge builders to God. They represented God to man and man to God. It was almost as if they acted as ushers, bringing people into the presence of God. Uh, People could not come directly to God, so the Lord gave them priests, and the priests would mediate. They'd offer daily as well as yearly sacrifices on behalf of the people. And so because that was true in the Jewish religion, uh, a Jewish individual might ask somebody else, well, who is your mediator? Who mediates between you and God? especially a Jewish person speaking to uh, a Messianic or a Jewish Christian. They would say, listen, we have in the Old Testament our mediators. We have the priests and we have the high priest. We have somebody who can usher us into the presence of God. Who do you have? Who is it that you look to who can mediate for you? Uh, How are your sins going to be forgiven if you have no high priest entering into the Holy of Holies and, and offering the blood sacrifice on a yearly basis on the Day of Atonement. If you don't have a mediator, then who makes those sacrifices for you? And so to these questions, the Christian would point to Jesus Christ as our priest and as our mediator. Uh, This is not, by the way, simply an Old Testament question that could be asked by a Jewish individual to a, a Jewish believer at his time. That question is asked even to this day in different forms. Um, Perhaps many of you might know that the Mormon church has a system of priests. They believe themselves to be descendants, if you will. They have Aaronic priesthood and all, and they consider themselves to have a priesthood. And so I remember on one occasion many years ago now having a young Mormon missionary speaking to me and, and asking me the same question, who's your mediator? Because I had spoken to him and I had asked him, Uh, Why are you trying to bring me into the Mormon church? Um, What do you have to offer me? And their response, the young man's response was, um, we have the priesthood. And I remember pointing out this particular passage by saying to them, I have a priest, Jesus Christ, who is my high priest. That was the answer that was given by Jewish Christians 2,000 years ago. That's the answer that believers give to this day. We have somebody who is our mediator, and that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who brings us to God. Now, he made that statement himself. We all know the Scripture, John 14, verse 6, I am the truth, the way, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But that's not the only place that is pointed out. It's also pointed out in 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, and that is the man Christ Jesus. We see that in Romans 8, verse 34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, yes, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. We see it in 1 Peter 3, 18. Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. We see that in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not, 
And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So the writer here wants us to know that we have a mediator. And it really answers the question, who is your priest? Who brings you to God? And that's what we're going to be looking at today as he speaks concerning Jesus Christ, who is our mediator, who is our high priest. Now, in the first four verses here, and we'll look at those in, uh, together, he begins to speak concerning the qualifications of the high priest. He actually gives us four qualifications in these four verses, four qualifications for the high priest, and we'll look at those one at a time. One, he points out that it is God who appoints the high priest. Two, he points out the high priest is taken from among men. Three, he points out that the high priest understands human weakness and four, he points out that the high priest offers sacrifice on behalf of people. God appoints him. He's taken from among men. He understands human weakness, and he offers sacrifice. And that's what we see in the first four verses here, and it's all applied to Jesus Christ. Now, the first thing we note in verse 1 is it says it this way. Every high priest is taken from among men. That word taken is another word for chosen, selected. The high priest was selected by God taken from among men. And it's very clear who does that because in verse 4 he tells us, no man takes this honor to himself but he who is called by God. And so the first thing he's pointing out is that God appoints the high priest. In other words, high priesthood was not something that you studied for. It wasn't something that you received through selfish ambition. It wasn't something that you planned to have. From the very beginning, the high priest was an individual selected to that position by God himself. You can see that with the very first high priest in the Old Testament, a man by the name of Aaron. Aaron was the brother of Moses and was the first high priest and was specifically uh, selected by God. If you take notes, Exodus chapter 28 verse 1 points that out. In the Old Testament it says, have Aaron, your brother, brought to you from among the Israelites, along with his sons Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, so that they may serve me as priests. So the first thing he points out is that the high priest is selected by God. Ministry, serving the Lord, is always by selection, and God selected the high priest. I can remember when my son David was a little boy, a very little boy, just six or seven years of age. I'll never forget what he said to me one day. He said, you know, Dad, when I'm an older man, I'm going to take the church over. And I said, oh, really? He said, well, yeah, just think about it. You don't have to change the name in the bulletin. You can still be Pastor David. Well, I said, that's a great thing, son, and, and all of that. And it would be a thrill for me to be able to hand over my ministry to you, and God knows I'd love to do that. But I don't uh, select the pastor of the church. Uh, God does. And you can't study for that, and you can't prepare yourself to be the pastor of the church or a pastor, period. Well, if it's true being uh, selected as a pastor, it is more true, if you will, being selected as high priest. And that's the point that was being made. One, he was saying, listen, you need to know and remember that every high priest is actually chosen by God, selected by God. God is the one who makes that choice. And remember with me, he's saying, remember Aaron, and remember the priesthood in the Hebrew religion, and, and remember how God is the one who selected Aaron, and God continues to select the priest. So the point he's making here is Jesus Christ was appointed by God to be the high priest. Jesus, in other words, had been selected. Now, he makes it clear various times. We see it uh, in verse 4, we see it in verse 5, we see it in verse 6, and verse 10. It's repeated for emphasis, making it clear that Jesus Christ is selected by God. And so Jesus is appointed by God. The second thing he points out is every priest is taken from among men. In other words, a priest must partake in the nature of the ones for whom he officiates. And only a man can understand human nature and human temptation. And this wasn't a place for, a, for an angel. An angel could not do that because an angel does not have human nature. An angel cannot be a high priest, cannot be a mediator, because an angel does not have human nature and therefore doesn't understand human weaknesses. You need to keep that in mind once again, because Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you that Jesus Christ is Michael the archangel. They teach that, that Jesus is Michael the archangel. The name Michael means uh, who is like God, and they have a very large, contrived argument to try and demonstrate to you that Jesus is the first creation of God, is Michael the archangel. But the fact is, he was chosen from among men because men have human nature. 
And therefore, the high priest had to be a person of human nature, which brings us to the third thing, that he understands human weakness. He has compassion, according to verse 2, on those who are ignorant and going astray. So he understands human weakness. He has compassion on the ignorant and those going astray because it says he himself is also beset or subject to by weakness. So a high priest is a human being, therefore he understands human weakness. Messiah needs to sympathize with human weakness to adequately present a man to God. See, you don't have a Savior, you don't have a Messiah that is out there and distant. You know, sometimes we may be thinking of God in that way. We think that God is just so far and so distant from us that He doesn't understand us, and that's just not true at all. One of the things the Holy Spirit has been trying to teach me for many years is that He understands me, that He understands everything about me, and the way that I know that is Scripture reveals that, and then I take into consideration that as a human being, He went through the variety of things as a human being that I do too. He was subject to the same things. In other words, he got hungry like I do. He got thirsty as I do. He got sleepy as I do. He understood all of those things and therefore has sympathy. And so the Lord Jesus Christ understands us. Now, the high priest, being a human being, obviously understands other human beings. He was prone to sin and therefore, and you'll see this in a moment, would offer sacrifice for himself as well as the people. Jesus, on the other, other, on the other hand, was never in sin, never did sin, and, and therefore could sympathize with our weaknesses but never experienced the sin that we, that we have to combat. But the thing is, a human high priest was sympathetic because he understands weaknesses. That gives him the ability to have compassion on somebody who's hurting. Why? Because he went through the same kinds of things. I have a friend of mine is in our fellowship. Um, his name is Renato. I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this. I don't, I don't think he would. Re Renato, and, and Renato comes to our fellowship. He's the lead singer uh, for uh, two or more. And, and we were, yesterday we were uh, together with his brothers and, and the rest of the group um, at the men's conference. And, uh, and as I was seated, uh, they're waiting for my opportunity to go up and, and share and all. Uh, I had just been told that, that Renato's uh, grandmother went home to be with the Lord. She was a few days short of 105 years of age. Yeah, the Lord blessed her with many years in life, and, and that's wonderful. And, and all, but you might find this to be a blessing, and he was rejoicing in it. His mama got, his grandma got saved when she was 95. 95 years old. God is sure good and compassionate and very patient. 95 years. But grandma gave her heart to Christ. And, but she died a couple of days ago, three days ago now. And, and Renato came and was seated next to me. And, uh, and, I, and I was aware of the fact that his grandmother had just gone home to be with the Lord just two days before. And, and as he sat next to me, he began to share with me a little bit about his grandma and, and how his dad was there yesterday at the uh, conference and, and how dad felt losing his mom and, you know, those kinds of things. And, and as he's sharing with me, um, I, I began to share with him some things and, and, and some things that I've learned personally through the loss of those whom I love. And, and as I was sharing with him, uh, yeah, I understand exactly what you're feeling like because he said, you know, he goes, I've never lost anybody a friend, a relative, anybody, I, I've never seen them die. He said, this is the first time in my life that I have seen somebody like my grandmother uh, die, he said, and, and, I'm, and I'm shaken. And, and as he's speaking to me, he, he, he does what anyone would do. He begins to weep, and the tears are pouring down his face. And, and, and I reach my arm around him. I hope you don't mind me explaining that. But I put my arm around him, and I held him in my arms. And, and, as, and he just he composed himself, and I just put my arms around him, and, and I shared with him, and I, and I shared the things that God has taught me about that. You see, that's what he's saying here. He can have compassion. The high priest can have compassion because he knows what those people are going through. He's not distant, in other words. He's not out there separated and, and saying, oh, you know, shut up. Stop crying. What are you whining about? You know, stiff upper lip. Don't you have any faith? The high priest wasn't that way at all. Why? Because he was taken from among men. Because he understands weaknesses. He understands loss. He has compassion. And, and that was the high priest. And, and the writer is saying, you know, you have a human high priest, but you have Messiah who is your high priest. And, and Jesus Christ, 
Christ understands those things. No, he never sinned. Of course he didn't. Remember chapter 4, verse 15, uh, which reads, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with, with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Jesus never sinned. He never participated in man's sin, though he does understand men's feelings. Jesus was, was one who committed no sin, and Jesus Christ takes our sins away, and in him, according to 1 John 3, 5, there is no sin. But he can deal uh, gently with the ignorant and those going astray and have sympathy. Now, in verse 2, when he says the ignorant and those going astray, uh, it, it's another way of saying ignorant, those who sin uh, not by choice but, but by mistake. There are, there are times that we can actually uh, uh, break a law without even knowing that we, that we are. You know that to be true. If you've been pulled over by a police officer and the officer says, why are you, did you do this? And you can look at him and you can say, what are you talking about? I didn't do that. Yes, you did. We saw you. Uh, well, is that against the law? Oh, yeah, there's a law in this, in this city or this county that says you can't do that. Oh, well, that was my mistake. I didn't intend to do that. Many of us have tried to argue ourselves out of tickets that way, and sometimes we actually didn't mean to do that. That's an ignorant thing, but you still broke the law. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. And so he speaks concerning that. He says, you can be ignorant, the ignorant who, who sin by mistake, but he also speaks of those who are going astray. Interesting way of putting it. Those who are being led astray, literally is what he's talking about. Those who have been influenced, who are moving away from doing the right thing. And so he deals gently with the ignorant and those going astray and has sympathy with them. In other words, he treats them with compassion because they are unintentionally going in the wrong direction. Now, because of this, according to verse 3, he's required, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. And so what he does is he makes an offering, an offering for sins. He offered gifts and sacrifices, and that's what the, the priest would do. Uh, when he gave the gifts, that would be um, grain offerings. It could be financial offerings unto the Lord that he would offer, it, but it was bloodless. When he made sacrifice, those are sin offerings. Now, these sacrifices didn't eradicate a person's ability to sin, but provide forgiveness for them because they have sinned. And so the priest would offer sin offerings, and, and what he would do is he'd offer sacrifice for himself as well as for the sins of the people. Uh, revealing that he has relationship with them as a human being. That's what it means in verse 3 when it says, because of this he's required, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. Verse 4, no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God just as Aaron was. So he returns to the thought of verse 1 by pointing out very specifically that the Lord Jesus Christ was anointed by God to be the high priest. Now, he's developing all of this, and now he's going to go a little bit further. Verse 5, so also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And so he answers the question, how can Jesus be high priest? Remember with me, and some of you are familiar with this already. Perhaps some of you aren't aware of this yet. The high priest was taken from a certain tribe. The tribe that the high priest was to be taken from is the tribe of Levi. The tribe of Levi was the tribe that Aaron was from, the nation of Israel being broken into 12 specific tribes. The Levitical tribe is the priestly tribe. Here's the question. Jesus Christ is not of the tribe of Levi. How can he be a high priest? Jesus came from Judah. And because he's from a different tribe, the question obviously would be asked, listen, if God selects the high priests from among men who are from the Levitical background, how is it possible that he would be referred to as a high priest because he isn't from Levi? How did Jesus Christ become the high priest if he's not a Levite? And so the answer is the priesthood is not after Levi, but actually predates Levi. Now, how did that happen? Well, he makes reference to somebody named Melchizedek. 
Melchizedek is one of those really interesting people in Scripture that, that basically, basically they appear and they disappear, and you don't have a lot of information about this guy, Melchizedek. You see him in the book of Genesis, you see him in the Psalms, and you see him several times here in the book of Hebrews. A man by the name of Melchizedek. But what is happening here is the writer is saying, listen, the order of priesthood that Jesus Christ is part of is not Levitical, but predates the Le Levitical because Melchizedek was an individual who went to Abraham. And Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, actually um, regarded him as priest of the Most High God and even offered sacrifices and gave to him offerings. And so his point is, is that uh, Jesus Christ is other, uh, after an older order. In Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, uh, the Bible speaking of Melchizedek says that he was a king of ancient Salem. When you see Salem in the Old Testament, that's another name for Jerusalem. So Melchizedek was the king of ancient Jerusalem is the point that he's making. In Psalm 110, verse 4, which is a messianic psalm, it says, The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Being a messianic psalm, that simply points out that Jesus Christ followed a different priestly order. Now, this man lived centuries before Aaron, and, and his priesthood, interestingly enough, and it's almost, I'm almost wishing that I'd had just done a full study on Melchizedek as I'm speaking to you now, because I'm thinking of things that I should have told you. Um, but you don't know what I'm thinking, so it doesn't matter, does it? Um, <laughs> Melchizedek. I'm going to slow down and give you a few things. Um, very interesting man. He appears before us in Genesis. Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, offers him sacrifices, and he basically disappears. You'll see more of him later on in chapter 7, but he basically disappears from the scene. And yet, he is the priest of the Most High God, and he's the king of Salem. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Salem, king of peace. Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, the king of peace, is a type. We'll see this later on. I have to be careful not to get ahead of myself. He is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the point that's being made here by um, the writer of Hebrews. He is a type. Jesus Christ answers to certain elements that you see in him. The interesting thing about him, as I mentioned earlier, is you see him mentioned in Genesis 14. You see him mentioned in Psalm 110, but you never see him again. He appears on the scene and disappears, but he is used as a type because he has no genealogy, having neither father nor mother, he says later on, which is a picture of the eternality of Christ in the sense of Jesus is inhabiting eternity. And so they use Melchizedek as a type to present the priesthood. The priesthood that Melchizedek, Melchizedek has predates the Aaronic priesthood by some six centuries. Because he appears on the scene something like 2,000 years before Christ, and, and the Levitical priesthood doesn't appear until about 1,400 years before Christ. So 600 years pass between the mention of Melchizedek and the revelation of the priesthood. The argument that the writer of Hebrews is giving, therefore, is that Jesus' priesthood predates the Levitical priesthood. So a Jewish individual who will be saying, how can you say that Jesus, Messiah, is Messiah and is, is a, a high priest, seeing that he's not from the tribe of Levi? The answer is, well, that's because he predates Levi, and that's because he actually is of a different lineage. That's what the psalmist in Psalm 110.4 says. You are of the order of Melchizedek. And so the point he's making here is that the high priest is appointed by God, taken from among men, understands human weaknesses, and offers sacrifices. Yes, it's true, Jesus Christ is not a Levitical priest, but he predates him following the line of Melchizedek. And so that's what he's saying in verse 5 when he says, So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. It was he who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. 
Now, by the way, when it says, you are my son, today I have begotten you, that's uh, out of the Psalms, Psalm 2, verse 7. But the picture of the begotten, or when Jesus was begotten, is, is in reference really to his resurrection. He was demonstrated to be the son of God by the resurrection. You see that in Romans chapter 1, I believe right around verse 4. And so Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the point that he's making and has the power of resurrection. And then in verse 6, or was raised by the power of the Spirit in his resurrection. And then verse 6, as he also says in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Who, in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And so he continues on for us to, to speak concerning Jesus Christ and his ministry. Now notice what he says, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications. When it speaks of his, the days of his flesh, that's another way of speaking of his incarnation, the 33 years that Jesus lived on the face of the earth. And as he lived, he offered up prayers, supplication, uh, vehement cries, and tears. Now, those words are all very powerful because prayers speaks of need. Supplications are urgent requests. Vehement cries are, are, are loud outcries from one who's deeply, been deeply disturbed, and, and tears are the visible manifestation of grief. And what he's speaking about is how the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was going through his time of agony, began to cry out to his Father. And as Jesus was there crying out to his Father, Luke tells us in, in uh, chapter 22, verse 44, being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. And so the passion of Christ there in the garden speaks of the prayers, supplications, the vehement cries, and the tears. The Bible tells us in Matthew 26, 39, that Jesus prayed, My Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And as Jesus was praying in that way, he has his disciples, a stone's throw away, and other disciples who are there at the entrance. He's got, he's got eight disciples at the entrance of the garden, He's got three that he brought in further with him. And these three who were brought in further with him uh, can see him in the darkness and hear him as he's weeping and crying. And yet they're falling asleep. And three different times, the scripture says, Jesus went to them and said, Are you sleeping? Watch and pray. You need to awaken. Be aware. This is the last moments. And, and he would speak to them, and then he'd awaken them, and then he'd go back, and he'd fall on his face before his father, and, and he'd cry out. And, and as he prayed, he'd say, My father, if, it's, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, he finally cries out, Then may your will be done. If there's any other way, if salvation can be won through any other means, if there's any other sacrifice other than what I have to go through, oh, Father, may that be so. Can you imagine that for just a moment? As the son cries out to the father and he's saying, I'm about to be separated from you. I'm about to go through the agony of death uh, and, and the torture and, and all that, that, I will, that I will endure tonight. Is there any other way that this can take place? Is there any other offering? Is there any other thing, a substitute of some sort? Is this the only way? And, and yet the Bible tells us that he ultimately simply said, not my will but yours be done. That's how it worked out. And yet the Bible tells us very specifically here that he was heard. As he cried out in verse 7, it says here, it says that he was heard because of his godly fear. His father heard him but did nothing to stop it because there was no other way. I was a young man once and I was teaching a home Bible study back in 1973. And one of the uh, members of that Bible study who has since gone home to be with the Lord, her name was Claudette. Claudette uh, had a young boy, her little boy. She had, I, I believe, three daughters and her last uh, was her son. And he was just a little guy and, and he was very ill. And I remember her coming to see me. She lived just down the street and all and and she came and uh, knocked on the door and came in and, and sat down. And, 
and began to share with me that her little boy was very ill, and she had taken him to the doctor, and he wasn't getting any better. And, and, and I was just a young guy. What do I know? I was yet to be married. I had no children of my own and all, but I do remember that she was sharing with me and saying, um, I, I don't know, I keep crying to God for him. She said, David, I, I'm, I'm asking God to heal him, and, and, and God isn't, isn't listening. God is not healing him, and he is so ill, and, and he was. He, was, he had a very high temperature, and he just wasn't getting any better, and, and she was crying as a mama would, and, and she kept on saying that to me, and finally she said to me, where is God? Where is God? Where is God now that my son is in this way? Where is God now? Can't he see my son? Where is God now? And I remember looking at Claudette, and I said, Claudette, I said, God is in the same place he was when he watched his son die on a cross. He's in the same place. He hasn't moved. He's aware of your tears. He's aware of your pain. He's aware of your concern. He's aware. He's not hidden from you. He sees you. But the Lord had placed it on my heart to remind her that he's in the same place he was when he watched his son die on a cross. That doesn't show a lack of love when you allow somebody to go through something like that. In the case of Jesus Christ, it most certainly didn't show lack of love. His father heard him. He was heard, the scripture in verse 7 says, because of his godly fear. He heard. God heard him. And notice with me how it says, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. As you read that, you might think, uh, the one who could have saved him from death in the sense of keeping him from dying, that's not what the word means. Uh, when it says save him from death, uh, the word is in Greek, ekthanatos, E-K-thanatos, C-H-A-N-A-T-O-S, ekthanatos, which literally is, he, can, he, he prayed to the one, uh, this is what's powerful about this, by the way, he prayed to the one who can save him out of death. What it was speaking about is he was praying to the one who would resurrect him. He was praying for the promise of resurrection, not that he wouldn't die on the cross, but he was just lifting up the reality that he would die, yes, but be resurrected. He was speaking to the one who would bring him back. Uh, it's not that he prayed not to die, because he knew why he was here in the first place. He knew he had come to give up his life. In John 12, verse 27, uh, Jesus said it this way, My heart is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. He didn't pray, God, I don't want to die. He was praying to the Lord and saying to him, after he had come to the, uh, the point of conclusion of, I know what I'm to do, he was simply saying to him, I know, and I am praying to the one who can resurrect me. I'm praying to the one who can bring me out of the grave, even as the Scripture promises. And he was praying according to that. And notice again in verse 7, he was heard because of his godly fear. In other words, he was completely submitted to his father, and that's why he prayed, thy will be done, and submitted himself. Now, in verse 8, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And it's not saying that he learned to be obedient. It's not saying he learned to, to be obedient because he always was obedient. Remember in John 8, 29, how he said, he who sent me is with me. The father has not left me alone. I do always those things that please him. Jesus is the only human being who ever lived who could look at his own mother and say, can you convict me of sin? Can you imagine that for a minute? I talk to my mom all the time. I've never said that to her. Can you convict me of sin? Where do you want me to start, son? You know, how, how many years do you have? You know, my mom, of course, my dad could have, my brothers and my sisters. I couldn't walk up to my brother Frank and say, Frank, just tell me one time that I've done wrong. I mean, come on. I mean, he's my older brother. He knows what I've been like. And my sisters, of course, my wife, every person who knows me can convict me of sin, some great sin, some minor sin, but sin, yes. And, and yet Jesus is the only person who ever lived who could look at his mother straight in the face and say, is there anything that I've ever done wrong, anything that I've ever done that was disobedient in any way, shape, or form, can you convict me of ever sinning? And the answer was obviously no. Nobody could. That's why we call him our Savior, because he's able to do that. So when it says here that he learned obedience, it isn't that he learned obedience or to be obedient. He always was. What it is speaking about is he learned the full cost of obedience. 
And the full cost of obedience was the death on the cross. As God, he knows all things. As man, he experiences suffering and learns the price that full obedience exacts, which is to die on the cross. And that's what he was learning, the full cost of obedience. Now, it says in verse 9, having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. Having been perfected. When it says having been perfected, the word perfected has nothing to do with moral perfection. Jesus already was morally perfect. He had no sin. What it speaks of is being brought to full qualification through suffering. The Scripture uses the word perfect in various ways. It can speak concerning that which has no error or sin. But normally, when you read the word perfect, it speaks of that which is fully mature or has come to completion. And so when it speaks here concerning that, having been perfected, it, it speaks concerning the fact that he has been brought to a full qualification through the things that he went through, through the suffering. And so Jesus Christ is brought to the place, in other words, of dying on the cross. And in doing so, he becomes the author of eternal salvation to all, I want you to notice this, to all who obey him. To obey him is an evidence of loving him. Remember what he said in John 14, 15? If you love me, keep my commandments. In, in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? And so those who obey him demonstrate that they love him. It's one thing for me to say, I love the Lord. It's another thing for me to demonstrate that. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven is what Jesus said, which is a demonstration of true regeneration. There's a lot of people, in other words, who have said faith and they have head faith, but they don't have acting faith. Faith actually works itself out because a person who says, I have faith but has no works is not telling the truth because works go along with faith. And so it's a one thing for a person to say, well, I was raised in the United States. 83% of Americans call themselves Christians. And a good portion of that 83% refer to themselves as born again or evangelical, defining themselves by the born again experience. You know, we have a whole lot of formal Christians in the United States. Of course, we have people who are referred to as denominational Christians, meaning that they've been raised in certain denominations, whatever it may be, from the Catholic to the Presbyterian to uh, the Methodist, you name it. They're denominational. And many of those within the denominations are what are called nominal, meaning in name only. And so there are numerous people who will take the surveys and when asked, what is your religious preference, will say, I am a Christian. Sometimes I watch some of these girl shows with Marie. You know, I admit it. I'm not ashamed. <laughs> Actually, I am to a degree. I probably shouldn't have said this to you. But anyway, sometimes I do. You know, whose wedding is it or something like that. I forget. Some wedding programs. And Marie's really not big on that either. But we'll sit down once in a while just to be fascinated. Oh, this is the Bridezilla. Anybody ever seen that one? Oh, amazing. Bridezilla. Amazing. Monstrous, monstrous brides. But and it's, it's almost entertaining if it's so tragic, but I do. I have seen it. And, and, and I watch that, and these people sometimes are just so profane. I mean, they get so angry, and, and they're so mean, and, and they use some very colorful language sometimes, and, 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 and they just go berserk, and, and they freak, and, and it's, all, it's all just before their weddings. You know, you ought to see them after the wedding, but it's all before the wedding. And, and they'll go all freaky even in the church. And they get mad at the pastors or they get mad at the, at the bridesmaids. And, and they're all really angry. And, you know, and, and then they're walking up saying, you know, before God, I promise. And I trip on that. I just go, wow. I mean, they don't have a clue what they're saying. No idea at all about their commitments they're making to God and man because they want a church wedding. But if you were to ask them why, they're not going to say, because I love the Lord Jesus Christ. He's transformed my life. I'm walking in the Spirit. I prayed for this person to be my husband or wife. They don't say that. It's because that's what we do. We get married in churches. 
I mean, we're called Calvary Chapel. You can imagine the amount of calls we would get at the first. People asking, can we use the chapel for weddings? Because they thought we were Calvary Wedding Chapel. And, and, and I would share, I've shared in the early days with our church, just because we're called Calvary Chapel and just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean that, that we will marry just anybody who approaches us. You go through premarital counseling with us. We want to make sure that you're not unevenly yoked together with an unbeliever. We want to make sure that you lay your foundations right in Jesus Christ because I said I'm a pastor, not a wedding chaplain. I'm a person who makes sure that the people that I am officiating over understand the, what it means to be married because I'm not about to do that and and not honor God. And you need to understand that too. And I used to be very clear at the first because I had to be because people would come to church thinking, well, it's a church. He's a pastor. He'll marry me for a few bucks. And it doesn't work that way at all. It doesn't work that way at all. And yet we live in the United States. And today a lot of people claim to be Christian, even want to have Christian marriages, and all, but they're not walking with the Lord. That's why Jesus Christ is somebody that we obey. And that's what it says. Having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And so Jesus Christ says to, him, says to us that there are things that he wants us to do, and therefore we say, yes, Lord, I will do that. Why? Because I love you because I've been born again. And when you called me and said to commit my heart to you, to be born again, I responded to that, and from that point on have had a heart to respond in obedience to you. That's how it works. All you need to do is ask yourself, if you want to test yourself whether Christ is in you, is do you long to be obedient to him? Does that matter to you? Do you desire to obey him? Because if you have a desire to obey him, it's good. There's a good evidence that you know him, that you have relationship with him. I don't know if I should tell you this. It came to mind. Okay. <laughs> mm, how do I say it? Okay. Um, I was an assisting pastor, and the senior pastor, I was outside talking to him just before service when my wife Marie, this is many, many years ago, 27, 28 years ago now, and Marie walks up, and the senior pastor looks at my wife and says to her, you're supposed to be in church right now. Church services has begun. And Marie looks at him and says, you're not my husband. And I look at my feet. <laughs> I'm the assistant pastor. And she's telling the senior pastor, you're not my husband. And I looked at her and I smiled at her. I said, baby, you better get into church. Okay. She goes in. <laughs> Later on, I talk to her. I say, honey, he may not be your husband, but he is the pastor of the church. Well, you're my husband. I realize that, and thank God for it every day, I promise you. <laughs> I promise you. But baby, when he says that you need to do something, that's because you need to do it. Obey. Well, see, she was already learning to obey her husband. There ain't nobody else I'm going to obey, that kind of thing. <laughs> and <laughs> but we obey Jesus Christ because he has the right to command me. And the fact that, that he is, in that spiritual sense, the one who, who is over the church, the church being the bride of Christ, then quite obviously the bride of Christ obeys Jesus Christ, which demonstrates that they have relationship with him. If I don't want to obey him, it's because I have no relationship with him. I haven't recognized his authority in my life. I have to bow my knee to him. And that's the point. It's a simple point. He is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. We obeyed him by yielding our life to him and therefore follow him from that point on. And in verse 10, he's called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Called by God, once again repeating what he started in verse 1 and repeated later, that he is called by God. God to be after this order. He wasn't appointed by men, didn't take it to himself, was appointed by God. And as such, he has the right to give to us commands because he is our high priest. 